Yeah. Awesome. Well, hello again, everyone. You probably know me by now. My name is Pandy Knight. I'm the Automation Panda, a developer advocate, and a Pythonista. Um, I know this is the last talk of the conference, and we've had our heads crammed full of technical knowledge. So for the first few minutes, I would just want to have more of a real moment. Um, the past three years have been pretty interesting, haven't they? Right? I mean, it was three years ago was the last time we had in-person Pi Texas. Um, I was here. I was on this stage. It was pretty awesome. Um, but one thing I've learned is that it's, it's good to be human. <laughs> it's good to have these connections, to meet up in person, to have real time, to have real talk. Um, and so rather than lead off by saying, yeah, I'm a developer advocate and test guru and blah, 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 uh, I want to show you more about who I am. Um, here on the screen are two of my best friends. Um, this is my wife, Lu Jing, and our little puppy dog, Suki, a uh, six-month-old French bulldog. Isn't she adorable? I mean, both of them, but particularly the puppy. Like, I am a changed man. I never used to like dogs, but man, I, I've been FOMOing being here and not home. I keep looking at puppy photos on my phone the whole time. Yeah. Um, also, during pandemic, aside from Python and software stuff, I've gotten into classic cars. Um, this is a 1970 Volkswagen Beetle. This is mine. Um, also, Suki is in there because I just love having my favorite things together. Um, and, and when I say this is my car, this is not like, oh, I have a car I keep in the garage and pull out on sunny days. This is my daily driver because my, my modern car died. <laughs> and we had this, this awesome idea of, well, why don't we just go backwards in history? And so, yes, I drive this to pick up groceries and visit my friends and stuff. Um, it's been a project. You can ask me about that later. Oh, gosh. Oh. Um, also, uh, I do a lot of uh, home renovation stuff together with my family. This is a house that used to be a TV grade fixer upper that we fixed up. My mother-in-law lives here. I, th I like to think it looks very nice and modern. Oh, and we have another classic car. This is a 1979 Volkswagen bus, type two. Um, it does not run at the moment. The Beetle does, this does not. We like to call this thing the big turd. And when we cover it up, we call it the big burrito. I'm currently working on it. This is a, you can see there's new wheels on this. So that's a little bit about me personally. Um, I know it's you know, a conference, a lot of technical stuff, but I'll be hanging around tonight if you want to like catch up, get dinner. I'd love to get to know y'all more as well. Um, as I said, I am developer advocate at Apple Tools, not Apple, Apple, Apple Tools. And so we do automated visual testing. Now, rather than tell you what that is, I'd rather show you. Um, here we have these classic side-by-side -side pictures. Can anyone spot the differences? How many do y'all see? Five, six, we see say four. Do, 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 do. Final answer? Wow. Okay. So y'all as humans have sat here and looked at this and hmmed and hot and tried to find out what the visual differences are. There are 10. There are 10 visual differences. This is what Apple Tools automates for you. Now you might be wondering, Andy, why are we why are we using some high power visual AI to figure out the difference in kids' books? We wouldn't apply this to, to, to spot the difference pictures. We'd apply this to things like web applications or mobile apps. Because when you develop things, you make changes. When changes happen, bugs can happen. Which bugs are really bad? The ones that look bad. So Apple Tools can come in, you slap that in as part of your testing, and you can quickly identify these visual regressions. That's what Apple Tools does in a nutshell. We also run Test Automation University. I've mentioned this before. Please go check it out. Awesome courses, totally free, super cool. So um, before I was a developer advocate at Apple Tools, um, I have been a software engineer and test for a long time. In fact, I actually worked at the same company that Chris currently works at, Q2. That was my previous job before, um, before um, what's the name of it? Oh my gosh, Apple Tools. <laughs> Wow, it is the last day of the conference. Woo, that Dr. Pepper's not keeping up with me. Okay, so I have lots of experience in testing and automation. In fact, I consider it my primary job these days as a developer advocate to advocate for you to help you improve your testing and automation practices. 
right? So what I'm about to tell you is the thesis of the talk today. If you were to take a screenshot and go home, call it a day, this is the value you're going to get out of my talk. If you want to test web apps in Python today, I recommend use Playwright. Playwright is what we're going to be learning today. So what is Playwright? Playwright is a relatively new web testing framework. This is test automation. What we do, it's a browser-based, or it's a browser-oriented tool. What it does is you, you load up your web application in a browser, and then you say, Playwright, go twiddle with it. Go click things, go scrape text, go, go enter text into fields, and check things on the page for me. And we form our test cases like that. Playwright makes that really easy. <laughs> Uh, it is an open source project from Microsoft. Um, I'm buddy-buddy with the team that, that develops it there. I think they've got about six engineers worldwide right now. Um, it's in the same division of Microsoft that makes TypeScript and VS Code. So it's, it's in good company. Something that's really cool about Playwright is not only does it have uh, implementation in Python, but it also has implementations in JavaScript slash TypeScript, Java, and C Sharp. Um, these are the four major test automation languages. <laughs> if you're in the testing automation space, you are doing your work in one of these four. Um, and for the Python implementation, it integrates with PyTest. Uh, how many people have heard of PyTest? Probably everyone. It's one of the, the more popular Python libraries. It is one of my personal favorite test frameworks in any language, not just Python. And, and believe me, I have done stuff in all of these languages <laughs> for test automation. Oh my gosh, war stories. So uh, Playwright is meant for what we call end-to-end -end testing, uh, specifically end-to-end -end web testing. Uh, what it does is it drives web applications, live web applications, through browser interactions. We're talking real browsers, real clicks, real waiting, all that stuff. Also has API support too, which is really cool. Um, but I want to make it clear, just so that we're not misunderstanding things, Playwright is not what we would call a unit testing framework. Um, there's a difference between testing code and testing features or behaviors. When we're testing code, we're looking at individual functions and methods and checking, calling them directly and seeing, okay, did, did the code we write actually do what we thought it should do? When we're talking about testing features and testing behaviors, what I'm trying to determine is if the behaviors in the application that the user is going to be doing are those working as intended. Um, unit tests are white box. They have direct access to the code with manipulation. End-to-end -end tests are black box. They are, you don't see the code. You're, you're literally playing with the browser almost as if a human would. So that's the kind of testing we're talking about with Playwright. Um, it's very good when you're developing a web app or a mobile app or something like that, or even a, an API microservice that you can hit it in a, that black box sense to make sure it's actually doing the thing we think. Now, Playwright is not the only tool out there. Um, you might have not blinked an eye saying, hey, oh, you're saying use Playwright. You may not know what the other tools are, but there are others, uh, namely something called Selenium WebDriver. Has anyone heard of Selenium? Okay, a lot of people, that's cool. Um, historically, Sel the Selenium project has been the primary browser automation tool in our industry. Um, it's been so prevalent that even not people who don't do testing and automation day to day like me have probably heard of Selenium. Um, it still is technically by popularity the top browser automation tool. I still use Selenium. I am a Selenium fanboy. I've been using Selenium for years. I have an open source project that's based on Selenium. It's called Boa Constrictor. Not Python, but if you want a sticker afterwards, let me know. Um, but I'm still standing by my statement today that here we are, what is this, March 2022? I would say if you're doing web automation in Python, I would recommend Playbright over Selenium. Why would I say that? I think Playwright has several key advantages. Again, this would be time, take the picture of the slide so you can take that home with you. Namely speed. Playwright is a lot faster <laughs> than Selenium. Um, it's faster because it uses debug protocols instead of the web driver protocol. Um, it's also faster in how it does setup and cleanup optimization. Also, Playwright is easier to set up. I'm gonna show you some commands. It's just boom and go. Whereas with Selenium web driver, you have to get extra stuff for each browser you want to test and add it to your path and inevitably somebody somewhere messes that up. So Playwright is just easier in that sense. Um, Playwright also has more mature features, things like automatic waiting. Like while you're waiting for a web page to load, you don't want to try to click a button until the button's ready. 
Right? That makes sense, right? And you would think, oh, if I'm going to have a framework to help me do web interactions, that the framework should be smart enough to wait for that thing to appear before it tries to click the thing. Right? That's what Playwright does for you. Selenium does not do this for you. <laughs> That's why web UI tests often have a bad reputation for being flaky. It's not so much the tool, it's how you use the tool. And unfortunately, Selenium, you need to be explicit more often with those kinds of things. Whereas Playwright, it just handles it as a concern for you. Uh, some other things, Playwright has web-centric assertions that focus not just on like general asserts of Boolean conditions, but actually on web elements. And there's also a lot of nice tracing that uh, Playwright comes with out of the box. Uh, screenshots, video, execution trace, more than I can even show today. So, um, quick caveat here. Um, Selenium and Playwright kind of have different approaches to how they're building their tools. Um, both Playwright and Selenium are open source. You can go to GitHub, you can look at their libraries, you can open pull requests. In fact, yesterday I was trying to open a pull request against Playwright Python. I did not get very far. Please encourage me. <laughs> um, but Selenium is more than just open source. The Selenium project also has open standards and open governance. Now, you might be wondering, well, what's the difference there? Huh? Open standards means that WebDriver itself is a W3C recommendation, meaning all major browsers are supposed to use it. And it has open governance in that there isn't any like one company that controls Selenium. It's more of people in the community coming together to kind of make the project happen. Uh, whereas Playwright, on the other hand, is run by Microsoft. Um, does this matter? You decide. Um, some people on this are very opinionated, very hotly opinionated, will annihilate you on Twitter if you express certain opinions contrary to this. I know this from firsthand experience. Um, if you want to learn more about that, let's go get some drinks afterwards and I'll share the whole story. But I just want to point that out there to say, hey, there, there, there are different philosophies behind these projects. And so that's something that may matter a lot to you. Awesome, cool. It may not matter to you. Um, my advice to you is think about it, look at it, and if you're okay with it, I think Playwright's awesome. I think Selenium's awesome too. They're both good tools. Me personally, I'm probably gonna use Playwright, hence I'm here giving the talk about it today. So what do you need to do to get started with Playwright? <coughs> you need at least Python 3.7. Uh, I recommend a Python editor. VS Code is what I'm gonna be using. PyCharm's good too, other things are good. Um, also, GitHub account is pretty, pretty handy. Uh, I have a full tutorial on getting started with Playwright. Uh, you can get it from this link. You can get it from this QR code. If you do all six chapters of this tutorial, which we're not going to do today, um, chapter six, you will definitely need a GitHub account for some of the cool stuff that happens. Um, so I would say another, take the screenshot, take this home with you if you want to learn more about this. Do the whole tutorial. I've got a full walkthrough. It is so awesome. I'm giving this as a tutorial at PyCon. Woo! So if I'm going to see who's, who's going to PyCon in Salt Lake, Oh, gosh. Not very many. Oh. Well, it's an awesome time, so if you can make it awesome, if not, no worries. <laughs> I will be there. I hope. I don't, think, I don't think so. I haven't seen the tweet that says they're sold out yet, but always a good time. All right, so to get started with Playwright, you got, or to get started with Playwright in Python, I should say, first of all, read the docs, playwright.dev, awesome. Uh, you need three three, um, what do we call them? Dependency packages, wow. <laughs> Technically, you only need one, but since we're gonna be doing Playwright together with PyTest, we're gonna need three. You need Playwright, which is Playwright proper, PyTest, which is PyTest proper, and then PyTest Playwright, which is a PyTest plugin for Playwright. <laughs> Too many pulls there. You can add that to an existing project, you can make it a whole new project for your tests. Um, in the tutorial that I wrote, also again this, this QR code, um, I walk through getting started, the first steps with Playwright, writing assertions, refactoring using page objects, which is a better way to structure your calls, some nifty tricks, and then also how to test APIs. Um, the goal for today is we're going to get through um, parts one, two, and three. <laughs> Maybe break into part four. So, who wants to see some code? Yeah, let's see some code, let's hope it works. Woo, okay, okay. Oh gosh, that did not, okay, that's um. The text is probably pretty small, isn't it? Yeah, let's, let's fix that, y'all. Is 
that better? Do we need it bigger? Okay, that's yeah, it's Texas, right? Everything's bigger, better in Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm from North Carolina. I can I can make fun of Texas. It's all good. I love y'all. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so here I have the tutorial project. In fact, I'm in one of the branches that aligns with the third chapter of it. Um, but this is just like any other Python project, right? Um, you could have a, a Django app where you're testing. You could have a Flask app you're testing. You could have an app that has nothing to do with Python. It could be full stack JavaScript. It doesn't matter. Um, the nice thing about end-to-end -end testing that we're doing in that it's black box, the language you use for your test automation does not necessarily have to be the language used to develop the site or the app. So I can write, I can have a whole team of testers that know Python and love Python hitting a full stack JavaScript. Totally cool, right? You can do this. Um, so here I've got just a, we're, this is Python, right? So we're doing it in Python. Um, we have our, oops, we have our tests directory, which when you're using PyTest, typically you put all your tests under the tests directory. Yay, that makes sense. And we have a test module named test underscore search. And this is where our PyTest test case is located. Now, the test we're going to do is a basic search engine search. We're going to go to DuckDuckGo. We're going to type in the search phrase panda. And we're going to make sure that the result page has links related to pandas. Pretty, pretty basic test, right? Nothing, nothing super, super challenging here. Just basic, almost what you consider like a smoke test for, let's say, if you have a search engine. So here's what the code looks like. <coughs> I'm going to import some stuff from Playwright. Um, note in Python, Playwright has a sync API and an async API. You can use either one. If you're doing tests and you're using what I consider to be recommended practices for your writing, for automating your tests, all you need is the sync API because you're doing things one thing at a time. Um, you can use Playwright purely for browser automation apart from test automation. Uh, let's say you wanted to like create a web scraper or crawler. You could, you could just use Playwright to, to um, automate those kinds of interactions. In that case, you might want to use this, the async API to get a little more optimization. Um, but since we're writing tests today, why? Because I'm, I'm writing tests. We're going to use sync API, and it's totally cool. We're going to have our PyTest function. Um, in PyTest, any function that's prefixed with test inside a module prefixed with test is identified as a test case. And I'm going to use Playwright's page fixture. In Playwright, everything comes off the page. Uh, you have a, your browser. From your browser, you make a browser context, which is like an incognito session. And then from the browser context, you can have any number of pages. Typically, you only need one. So um, uh, the PyTest plugin takes care of the browser, the browser context for us, and gives us a page in that context. Pretty cool. So we don't need to do a lot of boilerplate stuff. And so really, a lot of these calls are going to be very Pythonic. Um, my first step, given the DuckDuckGo homepage is displayed, oops, um, what's the call? Page.go to, and I put in my URL. Pretty straightforward. Um, if you're doing more high scale automation, you would probably want to make this some sort of environment variable or something. This is, like I said in the talk yesterday, you don't want to hard code this stuff, but eh, this is a tutorial, right? <laughs> so go to your URL. Now, if we want to do some interactions, when the user searches for a phrase, from the page, the page has a whole bunch of web elements, right? Your buttons, your headers, your input fields. These are all web elements. How do we identify web elements on a page? We locate them using locators. Uh, I'm sure everybody is probably familiar with things like CSS selectors and IDs, maybe XPaths. Does anybody use XPaths? Yeah, X, yeah, yeah. Try to use CSS selectors instead of XPath, pro tip. <laughs> but with Playwright, you can use any of these kinds of things. Um, typically, my, my MO is, does it have an ID that's unique? It does, cool, use that. Oh, it doesn't. Okay, let me use the CSS selector. Oh, crap, I need to do something positional. Okay, go ahead, let, let me use an XPath. That's typically how I do it. Here, we're using IDs. Um, what I want to do to search for a phrase, I want to find a locator for that search bar, and on DuckDuckGo, it has, that element has the ID search form input homepage. Cool. So I get my locator, and then I say, hey, fill it with this text. Type in panda. Why are we searching for pandas? Why not? <laughs> it 
Then once we type in the thing, what do we do? We can either hit enter or we can click the button. I'm going to click the button. So we find the home page button and we click it. Boom. Nice. So then what happens is that'll enter my search phrase and what we expect to happen is the page reloads and then shows, a, shows us uh, search results, right? So it's time to start verifying things on the page. Um, now, if you've used PyTest or unit test before, you're probably thinking, oh, okay, so we're gonna make a whole bunch of assert statements, right? Yes, technically we are, but because Playwright has web-first assertions that do smarter kinds of weighting for us, we could use Python's assert command, but it's a better practice to use Playwright's expect function. Um, this is going to work very similarly to expect in JavaScript if you've done that. Um, so, read this with me as if it's plain language. Um, so what I'm trying to verify that the search result query has the phrase that we have. So expect your page locator for your search form input to have the value panda. That's almost like English, right? Um, it's it's fluent like, <laughs> right? It's very readable. Um, this is what I love about Playwright's assertions that they they work like this. It's very very readable. And so what happens here is we don't need to perform any explicit weighting for this element. The this expect call with this condition will wait up to five seconds. I believe it's five seconds by default for the element located by this that that particular um, input to to eventually contain the value panda, which is our search phrase value. So if it takes the page two to three seconds to load, it's not gonna flake out on us. <laughs> if for some reason that field is blank, like the element appears in the field is blank, it's still gonna keep trying until it shows panda. And then after a timeout, if it still doesn't show panda, then it's only then will it give us the failure. So that makes your tests much more robust, which is awesome because if you don't have that waiting in there, you have flaky tests that sometimes pass and sometimes fail and nobody's happy. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, this is, this is kind of the core of the kinds of things you're gonna be doing in Playwright to automate the browser. Um, there's tons of different interactions. Uh, what, I, what I tell people is like, I'm not gonna go through every single one, but if you can do it as a human in a browser, Playwright can automate it for you. And if you wanna find out what the command is, um, if, as long as you're using typing in VS Code, you could do something like page dot and you get the autocomplete. Or if you have like page locator, oh wow, I can't spell. Come on, oh gosh, one-handed typing. Oh, we'll just click on it. Again, you've got all the autocomplete there. Um, and then the, you could also go to the Playwright docs and be like, how do I drag and drop? Oh, page dot drag and drop, cool. So it's, it's pretty easy to kind of figure out what you want to do. In a worst case, Kara, you Google it and you end up on Stack Overflow. Like, this, this is half my job. <laughs> I can't remember all these APIs between these different tools, man. I just look it up and boom, I find it. Um, or I go into the Playwright Slack and I ask the people and they're very helpful. So um, there are other assertions we're doing. There's some complicated stuff in here. Um, I don't want to get into it. This one is trying to scrape multiple links and make sure the titles all align. Uh, We'll, we'll skip that for now. <laughs> uh, you can also make assertions on the page rather than particular elements that are located. So let's actually run this so you can see it actually do the magic thing. So uh, I have a virtual environment with my dependencies. Yes, I'm using VNV, tough. Um, Python-m pytest, give it the directory name, tests. Um, by default, Playwright will run it on Chromium and it will run it headless and it will run it very fast. But since this is a conference and I want y'all to see it, I'm going to explicitly say run this in headed mode, meaning the browser will pop up and we'll see it, and run it with slow-mo, meaning every interaction is going to take a two second pause so that you can actually kind of see it step through. Um, this is actually pretty helpful when you're developing test automation, so you can kind of do it and see it go. Um, you could even debug and freeze it and then kind of go into the page and inspect to find things. So let's see what happens when we do this. Hands are off the keyboard. Pandas. Yeah. Did it pass? Woo! All right. Testing is awesome. It worked. Woohoo! Okay. So, I mean, that's that's basically what web UI testing is all about. 
Uh, we could add more tests to test different things, like did we want to flip over to images? Do we want to test different phrases? Do we want to make sure it opens to the next thing? Keep your tests atomic. Um, <coughs> some other things I can do with Playwright. Um, if I want to specify a different browser, I can do that on the command line as a test input, which is really nice. Um, interesting thing about browsers. Uh, Playwright does not use what we would consider like real browsers. <laughs> like you would think, oh, I want to test on Google Chrome. Uh, Playwright, you don't test on Google Chrome, you test on Chromium. Um, you don't test on Apple Safari, you test on WebKit. Um, and you also test on uh, Firefox's base project. Why do they do that? Um, just there, there's some optimizations, there's easier setup. Um, it's, I think the, the risk of finding a difference between rendering in Chromium versus Chrome is very low, so I'm okay to do that. But if you're in a team where you have compliance issues or regulations and you absolutely need to test, um, like full Chrome or Firefox or something. Playwright not, may not be cool for you. Um, Playwright can um, test the, the installed version of Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge on your machine, but it can't do full versions of the other browsers. But I mean, if I wanted to, I could say um, here, brow, br not Bowser, browser uh, WebKit, because I'm on Mac. WebKit. And now this time the browser. Yep, that's, that looks different. Ta -da, and it does the same test. <laughs> so you can do local cross-browser testing. Um, you could also like integrate this with Apple tools and do visual testing. Oh, that's cool. Um, I'm not going to show that. Um, I know I'm coming up on time here, but <coughs> does anybody have any questions about anything with Playwright or testing in general? I mean, I could show this all day. We'll, yes, Ali. Mm -hmm. I mean, it basically, you point and shoot at whatever kind of web app you want, right? It's, it's not like a URL-based thing. Like, you can, you can point it at a single-page application, start fiddling around with the buttons and the elements and stuff. It'll do the trick. Um, yeah, good question. Anybody else? Yes, Chris. Mm-hmm. Um, no. <laughs> you need some some type of selector. You need to be able to figure out your selector. So what I do is I just go to the page in Google Chrome manually and go to inspect and use DevTools to look at the, the DOM. And then I'll look for IDs. I'll look for um, p potential selectors or XPaths and do it that way. Um, and, oh, oh, some cool stuff about, about uh, Playwright selectors that Playwright does that Selenium doesn't do. Um, you, like I said, you can, you can do all this, the reg, regular kinds of selectors. Um, you can also do a text-based selector. So you could say something like text equals um, um, submit, or text equals save, like whatever the name of the button you're trying to click. And it'll find that element on the page based on a text matching, which is really, really nice. Because you can do text matching with XPaths. I don't know if you've done it before, but the query is like this long. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it does because it's a coded thing, you're not going to have like visual locators or anything. Um, I know that Playwright also supports like React and Vue specific stuff. I don't plunge that because that's project specific and CSS selectors 99% of the time are good enough. <laughs> but good question. Back there. Hmm. Great, great question. So there's a couple ways something might be hidden on a page. If it's got like, if it, if it is truly not visible on the page, um, I think you're probably going to get an exception when you try to interact with it because it's like it's not there. You can you can do things like you can check to see if it's like existing in the DOM, but if you're trying to like click a button that that is not appearing, it'll be like uh-uh. Um, <coughs> you could take a back door and do a JavaScript click to something that's hidden, and it might take it. Um, but there's also like um, a, a nice thing about Playwright is that it can handle Shadow DOM. Um, Selenium by default, I don't think I don't think Selenium can punch through the Shadow DOM. Playwright can, <laughs> so that's really nice. Yep. If a human can do it, automation can. Yes. WebGL, I have no idea. 
That's above me. I'm sorry. Oh, one more. Oh, gosh, this is awesome. Them's fighting words. <laughs> Come talk to me afterwards. I have opinions. I'll, I'll share my high level opinion. Um, in, in, in this space, there, when you're doing test automation, the big divide is between coded tools or codeless tools. Coded meaning you are a developer automating tests using code like Playwright, Selenium, Cypress is big in the JavaScript world. Those are the big three um, that are those are all like open source projects. Um, then there's a whole bunch of companies out there making um, codeless tools that are like website builders or screen recorders. And there's more than I, I can count. Um, me, I prefer the coded tools because <coughs> you have more control over them. Um, they're also open source and free, <laughs> which is nice. Um, but more, you, you can, if you know what you're doing, you can do more powerful things. Um, you can truly build high scale test automation solutions. You can tune them, you can refine them, you can make them be awesome. And so like that, that has been my career. <laughs> so if somebody's like, hey, do you wanna use like a smart bear tool? I'm like, probably not, no offense. <laughs> but that's just me. There is a time and place for codeless tools. You know, if, I mean, sorry, I'm ranting here, I'll finish up real quick. There are a lot of people in the industry who are testers who don't have strong programming skills. They may have been manual testers or human testers or exploratory testers since they graduated from college 20, 30 years ago. And Python or Java is like a whole new thing to them. Um, and they're being put into positions where their management is telling them, automate all the things. And so they're like, okay, well, I can spend two years trying to figure out a programming language or I can buy this tool that does it for me. That's a good use case. It's, it gets them farther than where they are today and delivers value. And so that's cool. That's not for me, but that's for them. <laughs> Alrighty, anything else? Cool, well thank you all very much. I'm, I'm honored to be here at Pi Texas and to give this last talk. Um, I'll, if, you, if you have more questions and wanna talk more about anything, I'll be around for a while. If you want panda stickers, please come hit me up. If you wanna see more pictures of my puppy or my Volkswagens, let me know, I'll be more than happy to share. <laughs>